but I'd now like to bring to the microphone our second speaker, Dr. Yoland Anshul. Uh, so I'm hoping everyone can see and hear me. Um, so thank you very much for asking me to um, speak tonight. So um, as has already been outlined, I'm both a medical oncologist like Michael, but I've, as long as I've been a medical oncologist, I've also been um, practicing in several family cancer centers in this area of cancer genetics. And I think ovarian cancer really is the poster child for um, the real um, meshing between uh, the idea of an inherited risk or this targeted driving, these, these genetic targets that drive cancer development and how pharmacotherapy can take advantage of that um, and how far we have come. So what we're going to do today is actually cover what on earth genes are um, and how are they relevant to ovarian cancer and ovarian cancer care. We're going to a little bit about the difference between familial versus tumour genes um, and how cancer treatments can change according to their genetic profiles, whether it's either inherited or in terms of tumour-related genetics. And then how do you test for these genetic changes? So just some basic background, and I apologise to all on the um, webinar if you are a molecular biologist, but a lot of this is going to take us right back to very basic um, concepts. So a gene is our basic unit. Um, it tells us exactly who our are. genes are very short segments of DNA and they're found in the chromosomes of all of our cells. Each gene contains a code that directs an essential production of protein that's very specific to that specific gene. So if we take ourselves into something more familiar, and particularly during COVID-19 isolation and home cooking, you can't get cake mix or flour or sugar in any supermarket at the moment because everyone's doing lots of cooking. Genes are kind of like the ingredients that if, and a recipe that if is read from beginning to end in exactly the right order and all the ingredients are exactly the the right ingredients, then you'll end up making a beautiful cake. So the cake is the outcome of the functioning gene that is read from beginning to end. So what's inheritance? So we all have around 20 to 30,000 genes and genes make up what our chromosomes are. Some of you might have seen little pictures of chromosomes. There's um, two copies um, each of the chromosomes, so two copies of each gene that we have. We get one from our mum and one from our dad, from the egg and from the sperm. Genes are who we are. They tell us how tall we're going to be, whether we're going to be sporty sports sports, whether we're going to be bookworms, whether we're more going down a musical line, whether we're more of an engineering, whether we have a scientific brain. It tells us what eye colour we'll have, what hair colour we have, unless we get someone to intervene with that. It also even influences things like personalities. And other things can influence that, but genetics certainly play a very strong role, or genes play a strong role in everything and who we are. So what happens when a gene is abnormal? So in our recipe for our beautiful cake, if we just change two little letters, SR in front of flour to a P in front of flour, you'll see that our beautiful, lovely cake turns into an absolute flop. And this very same thing can happen when there is a small change to the genetic code. It can lead to a very devastating outcome into what that gene was supposed to do in terms of protein production. So if we think back to genetic related conditions or diseases, you can think of many, the obvious ones, and I guess one of the most common ones in our community that we see um, is this trisomy 21. So that is an additional chromosome in, in, of 21 leading to Down syndrome. 
We know of many families who are affected by familial heart disease or have high blood pressure. We know that diabetes runs in families. And there are some rarer, but um, many, many thousands and thousands of genetic conditions that relate to abnormalities in our genes. So where does genes fit into cancer and particularly ovarian cancer? So let's go back to our kitchen. So cancer is abnormal production of cells. So cells go through this normal process of what's called cell division. And it should be a very ordered process, much like washing up is. You start washing up with a pile of dirty dishes, you wash them in this hot soapy water, you drain them and you dry them and you put them away. But if something happens to change that nice ordered process, much like Merlin did when he tried to automate the process of washing up in the film, The Sword and the Stone, then that whole process can become unregulated and very chaotic. So if we apply this to our cell division, here we have our beautiful normal cell. It's going through the division process to produce beautiful normal cells, what's called daughter cells, that are exact replicas of the mother cells. But if you have something happen and you have an abnormal cell or a cell that contains abnormalities, then there are lots of checkpoints in place to be able to correct those. And if they're not correctable, then there are other mechanisms in place by which that abnormal cell is sent off to die so that it can't go on and reproduce more abnormal cells. So what happens in cancer is that these abnormal cells are allowed to reproduce. And the more cell division that occurs, the more and more abnormal these cells become in future generations. And this is exactly what cancer is. It's normal cell division that has become abnormal and become so abnormal that it becomes self-regulating and self-growing. So our genes would normally act in here to both understand that there's an abnormality in a cell and, or if it can't correct, then send, send that cell to vibe. So this is when everything is functioning normally. But if our gene is not producing the normal protein, then it can't as he, act here. And so these abnormal cells are allowed to grow and divide and cancer risk is increased and cancers occur. So what happens if that abnormality in the gene is in our germline? So it's within the egg. It means that when that parent produces the child, every single cell in that body will also have that abnormality. It means that that gene abnormality is heritable. It can be passed from parent to child. In the case of these familial cancer genes, it means that that heritable risk for cancer can be transferred from parent to child. But what happens if the error in the gene actually just occurs along the way in the cells as they're growing and dividing? That's what's called a somatic or tumor mutation. So it's present in the cancer cells, but it's not present in the other cells in the body. It's not heritable. So it isn't something that can be passed on from a parent to a child. So genetic pathways influence normal cell growth in many different ways. And variants or mutations in these genes can also influence the normal regulation and normal repair pathways of cell growth, lead to uncontrolled growth, accumulated abnormalities, and genomic instability. So now we come to hereditary ovarian cancer. The likelihood of ovarian cancer or well, the likelihood of any cancer being hereditary varies with tumor type. If we look at ovarian cancer here in the middle, the chances of any woman with ovarian cancer, the chance of her having hereditary ovarian cancer is from around 10 through to 25%. It's actually one of the more common familial tumor types. 
If we look at colorectal cancer, only around 10% and in breast cancer, only 5 to 10% are likely to be hereditary or familial. The sort of genes that are associated with hereditary ovarian cancer is varied. BRCA1 and BRCA2 being the most common. Mismatch repair genes associated with a condition called Lynch syndrome is quite rare but well recognised. Lee Fraumini T53 is the gene there and then there are many other genes. The classic hereditary ovarian cancer families that we know and recognise are associated with the most common gene errors in BRCA1 and BRCA2. And these families, you'll often see other cancer types like breast cancer or prostate cancer or pancreatic cancer in the setting of a BRCA2 family. But we know from the Australian Ovarian Cancer Study where a thousand women who had ovarian cancer diagnosis who were tested for BRCA1 and BRCA2, of those women who were diagnosed with ovarian cancer in the setting of BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, 47% of them had no family history similar that you would see in these classic ovarian uh, BRCA1 or BRCA2 family types. So we no longer in ovarian cancer rely on a family history. What we do is rely on the tumor type itself. We know that the proportion of women with ovarian cancer who have other um, of, um, hereditary ovarian genes does vary according to tumor type. So if you have high grade serous ovarian cancer versus endometrioid cancer, versus clear cell cancer or mucinous cancer, then the likelihood of these hereditary genes changes very much. But if we take the most common, that being high-grade serous, we can see that that BRCA1 is the predominant gene followed by BRCA2 with a whole host of other genes now well recognized to be representative of other genes contributing to hereditary ovarian cancer. How do we test for hereditary ovarian cancer? So you can either use a blood or saliva sample to examine for these genetic changes. Remember that these genetic changes, because they're heritable, are in every cell. So we don't just need to test the tumor tissue, we can test any cell from that particular individual. The results of genetic testing might influence the, gen the person's long-term management. And you've already heard from Michael how the initiation of PARP inhibitors after initial surgery and chemotherapy is now being used to maintain the effect of chemotherapy and improving the chances of cure or survival of their ovarian cancer diagnosis. But additionally, if a gene change is identified, then management and testing options open up for other family members. Genetic testing is funded if the chance of an abnormal ovarian cancer gene is more than 10%, which as you know from that ovarian, uh, Australian ovarian cancer study is absolutely true of all women under the age of 75. But in Australia, family cancer centers will offer all women with high-grade serous ovarian cancer a genetic test to understand whether their um, ovarian cancer has occurred in the context of a hereditary change um, for all women, not just those under the age of 75. Genetic testing usually starts in someone who has had a cancer, but not all people who've had a cancer will be eligible for a funded gene test, uh, and this might relate to the type of ovarian cancer, particularly mucinous ovarian cancer, which is not likely to be associated with the BRCA1, BRCA2, or the other genes that are listed in the slides previously. The other thing that might influence gene testing in, the, in a family is whether the person who has been affected by cancer is still alive. And if the person is still alive, if they're actually wanting and willing to have genetic testing. So these can be influencing factors over ovarian cancer testing. We know that if someone is diagnosed with an underlying 
genetic change, and these I guess are the most common ovarian cancer genes, that they might be at increased risk of other cancer types, in particular breast cancer, in Lynch syndrome, bowel cancer and uterine cancer. For males, it may be prostate cancer or pancreatic cancer may be moderately increased compared to the general population. So where is genetic testing done? Traditionally, this has been offered through specialist genetic centers called familial cancer centers. But in more recent years, for women in particular who've been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, we've moved genetic testing into your local clinic. So your medical oncologist or your gynecology oncologist or your chemotherapy nurse might have offered you mainstreamed genetic testing. This is then followed up within the specialist genetic centers if there is in fact an actual mutation identified. So what are the inheritance patterns? Most of our hereditary ovarian cancer genes are what we call an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. So we only need one parent to carry this abnormal gene for it to be able to be passed on to the children in a one in two chance for each child that is conceived from that parentage. But there are some very rare ovarian cancer genes, Bloom and Fanconi anemia genes, which require both parents to carry the abnormal copy for the child to be affected if they have both copies, abnormal copies from each of their parents. So is genetic testing for everyone? No. There are pros and cons to everything, just like there are in everything in life. The pros can be ruling out a high-risk gene. Is this something that just affects you or is it something that is going to have in impact for others in my family? Um, does it give me an explanation for why my cancer occurred? Can I give some reassurance to my children whether they are or they're not at increased risk for a cancer? It might allow other family members to have a heads up that they are at increased risk and do something about that risk. So installing um, strategies to prevent cancers from occurring. But there are some cons. There can be some cons if an individual might not be eligible for gene testing and she might need to consider paying for that gene test herself. It might not be a definitive test. And we're going to cover some uh, this HRD concept or somatic or other reasons for tumor um, changes and susceptibility to PARP inhibition, the result might be confusing a variant of uncertain significance. So this is where we see a genetic change, but we don't currently know in 2020 whether this does or does not affect the gene function. It might not change cancer worry. It might have insurance implications. And not everyone in my family might actually want to know. So what about these non-hereditary genetic changes? These are changes within the tumor cells themselves. So here, this might be somatic mutations. So this is acquired changes within the genetic code in tumor cells themselves. It impacts the normal function of the gene within the tumor, but it isn't hereditary. Promoter methylation is the silencing of the very start point of the gene. So it's like closing the book on the recipe book and not allowing the recipe to be read right from the very start. Again, that will affect that gene function and it can be extremely rarely hereditary, but generally it's something seen just in these tumor cells. All of these somatic and methylation changes lead to this thing called homologous recombination deficiency that Michael's already alluded to. It's a very important part of the repair type of DNA damage involving many, many genes, including those that are well recognized to be associated with hereditary ovarian cancer. We know that germline, somatic mutations, methylation, particularly of BRCA1, can lead to homologous recombination deficiency. And it probably explains a large number of those responses to PARP inhibitors that have been seen, but don't actually carry those germline mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2. Can you have testing for homologous recombination? There are two companies that offer HRD testing, and they're open to Australian women, but it's done offshore. So it's done, both of these tests 
are done either in the US. So Myriad Genomics and Foundation Medicine are the two commercial available um, sites. Innovate may become, so Innovate was a study done in Australia that offered HRD testing within Australia. Um, and the Innovate team are actually working on opening up the availability of HRD testing for Australian women um, within the Australian um, shores, something that will be very, very appealing, particularly as these um, tests rely on the US dollar, and our dollar at the moment is extremely poor against the greenback. So this cost, these tests cost around about $5,000 US, which is about $8,000 Australian at the moment. So it'd be good to have an Australian option. So these genes we know can guide the use of systemic therapy and Michael's already alluded to the impact that it had on path inhibitor sensitivity, so I won't go into that. But BRCA mutation and probably HRD and all the other genes that contribute to HRD also predict for prolonged response to the very first chemotherapy that's used in the treatment for ovarian cancer, carboplatin. So women who have BRCA mutations tend to respond to carboplatin again and again and again if their tumors relapse, become stable, relapse again and become stable again and relapse again compared to those women who don't have one of these genetic mutations either in the germline or somatic. Just as a very quick sideline, we know that the Lynch-related tumors are associated with uh, a different genetic pathway called mismatch repair deficiency. And this has also become very important in terms of immunotherapy. But I'm not going into that in any detail today because the main thing has been to talk about PARP inhibitors. So I'll take any questions if there are any now. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Antle, for that informative presentation. We do have a couple of questions. The first one is, when might HRD testing become available for Australians without that cost of $8,000? So I spoke to um, some of the team leads in the Innovate study, and they're really hoping towards the end of the year that might become available for Australian women. Um, the two other commercial options are, are available now, but um, COVID-19 has put a real... Um, breaks on any progression of um, clinical pathways, and that will be a clinical pathway, so it might be on hold a little bit longer because of the impact on healthcare systems. Okay, thank you. Let's hope it is available sooner rather than later. Um, and just another question. My mum had genetic testing done, but it came back inconclusive. Would you suggest we get the test done again, or should we, her daughters, get some tests done ourselves? That's an excellent question. So um, all those other genes have been really um, added on to ovarian cancer panels in the last couple of years. So I guess it depends when your mum had her ovarian cancer genetic testing. And if it was many years ago, then it may be that her DNA is actually stored in the laboratory and you might go back and ask the clinical team or the genetics team, would it be reasonable to look at um, the other genes that might be associated with ovarian cancer risk. But if that genetic testing has been in very recent years, then probably all those other genes have been on the genetic panel that was done. In response to the question about whether um, if more genetic testing is going to be done, should it be done in her daughters? No, I would still encourage that the uh, genetic testing should be done in the person who's most likely going to answer the question for that family, and that is in someone who's actually experienced a cancer related to the genes that are being tested. Great, thank you, very helpful. Thanks again, Dr. Antel. Um, we really appreciate your time. I do, I have like... time, quick, do I have time to answer the question that Michael deferred to me about the age oh, of sure, risk reducing? Sorry. Yes. What is the current advice on the age that women who yep. carry the BRCA2 mutation should have their ovaries removed? Yeah, so I'll do. just answer that pretty generally. So the age at which we would recommend someone to consider a risk-reducing strategy would depend on the gene error that was identified. So whether it was BRCA1, RAD51C, PALB2. 
but it also will depend on the family history. So generally you would recommend um, around five years younger than the youngest person affected or in relation to the gene that is known in the family. If there's no genetic change of being able to be identified, then it comes back to the age of ovarian cancer occurring in the family members. So that would be something to take back to the family cancer centre. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Ansel. We really appreciate your time. Um